Bonjour, bienvenue à cette séance clinique modérée par Dr. Daryl Tan et, et moi-même, Deborah Money. J'ai le plaisir de vous présenter Professeur Jeannie Marazzo. Jeannie is a very accomplished clinician scientist, and we are extraordinarily pleased she's been able to join us from the University of Washington, Seattle. She's medical director of the Seattle STD HIV Prevention and Training Center. She's currently president of the American STD Association. She's also editor of the Journal of Sexually Transmitted Diseases. But most importantly, she's had a uh, very uh, illustrious career in the area of HIV and um, the vaginal microbiome, in particular, has been the co-chair of VOICE, a PrEP trial in Africa. And she's going to share with us her thoughts on biomedical prevention strategies for HIV in women. Thank you. Great. Well, it's really wonderful to be here. I want to thank Deb in particular and the organizers for allowing me to come to your beautiful city. And I'm going to try to be efficient because I'm following an excellent speaker, Dr. Corey, and really looking forward to Dr. Aspen's talk next. So let's go ahead. I can show you my conflict of interest slides here. And this is what I want to talk about. First of all, I want to define biomedical prevention because I want you to think about it somewhat differently than I think we have been selling it. Um, in the HIV arena. And I'll mention just very briefly why we need it, although I don't think I need to talk to this crowd about that. I'll review the evidence that it works or doesn't work. And I want to try to contextualize the disparate efficacy results we've seen, which I'm sure you are all familiar with and which Dr. Corey alluded to this morning in his talk. And then very briefly, I'll mention treatment as prevention. But I really want to focus on PrEP here. And if we have time, we can talk a little bit about the implications for delivery. Well, I don't think this group at all needs to be reminded of the magnitude of the continuing epidemic. Certainly in the US and Canada, our new infection rate has stabilized or been stable for the last probably 15 years at about 56,000 new infections a year. And actually looking at your statistics, I don't think that you are actually coming down in terms of incidence in high incidence groups either, primarily men who have sex with men and other vulnerable populations. So it's still a huge problem and obviously Obviously, we need prevention methods, to say the least. So how do you define biomedical prevention? It's interesting if you Google it or you go to Wikipedia or you look it up, there actually is no really widely sanctioned or recognized definition. So what I interpret the term to mean is a biological intervention that modifies a person's risk of acquiring diseases or conditions in the future. Indeed, the prototype is a vaccine, which you heard about very beautifully this morning. But I guess I want to sort of pose that there really, I think, in my mind, is no pure biomedical intervention. The only pure one would be putting something in the air that you can't avoid inhaling, or maybe putting something in the drinking water that you can't avoid consuming. Because really, every behavioral, every biomedical intervention requires volitional cho choice to take advantage of or to use that intervention. I don't know if you can see the slide, but it basically shows a woman watching TV and she says, ask your doctor if taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. It's a great idea, but again, you got to want to take that pill and the pill has to work. So just remember as we go through this talk, because this is a theme that's going to come up again and again, that the preventive interventions we're talking about really do require significant activity on the person that is going to hopefully take advantage of it. And what really modifies people's willingness to use these interventions probably relate to their perception of how effective they are and how important it is to prevent the outcomes they're intended to prevent. Okay, so let's just put that in the back of your mind and we'll come back to it. Now, I think many of you have seen a variation of this slide. Uh, this is adapted from Mike Cohen's um, uh, pictorial, talking about the spectrum of prevention strategies. And you can see before exposure, at exposure, and after infection. And I'm not obviously going to go through all of these. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them for you that I think are relevant as HIV care providers. I'll very briefly mention male circumcision, only because this is something that clearly has had widespread evidence um, of its efficacy. And the three large trials that have shown 
uh, clear efficacy in men are listed there, and essentially you've got a reduction of your risk of infection by about 50% in men. So that's very exciting. The Gates Foundation, many others are really invested in scaling up circumcision in men as a means to prevent HIV acquisition. Unfortunately, disappointingly, uh, no benefits for women have been demonstrated. Only one of these trials, the Rakai trial, evaluated the impact of male circumcision on acquisition in female partners of the men who were either circumcised immediately or delayed, and they actually stopped that recruitment of the women into the trial in an interim analysis due to futility. And in fact, there was a slightly increased early risk of transmission to women, probably associated to earlier resumption of intercourse before full healing after the circumcision. So you should know that because I actually have heard people say that circumcision was beneficial for men and women uh, in terms of HIV transmission, and that is not the case, unfortunately. So let's go ahead and just shift to PrEP, since I really want to spend a lot of time talking about that. So PrEP is defined as the provision of a chemopreventative agent at vulnerable sites prior to infection. A good example is malaria prophylaxis, certainly uh, something that we're probably all familiar with. But the rationale in terms of HIV infection, I think, is very nicely summarized here by this overview uh, by Dr. Garcia Lerma. And it really lies on the um, observation that infection of healthy mucosa with HIV actually requires a substantial dose of virus, uh, 10 to 6 to 10 to the 8th particles. And in theory, if you have active drug at the site of infection to at least knock out part or ideally all of those active virions, you could substantially reduce the likelihood of mucosal invasion or lymphatic invasion. The animal data have been incredibly supportive of PrEP, and that really was the driver for getting these things into clinical trials um, as it happened. However, a couple of important things for the animal data, which I will not bore you with in detail. First of all, you have to have adequate drug present at the exact time of exposure because the window of the opportunity for protection as depicted in this timeline is really probably within the first 48 hours, maybe 72, but you really need to have it present activated and in the tissue well before exposure. The animal data also strongly support the need for a post-exposure prophylaxis dose. In the macaque models, when the post-exposure prophylaxis dose of PrEP was omitted, there was a significant increase in the likelihood of infection with the simian HIV virus, um, so, or simian shiv. Um, so that really says that you need to have exposure bracketed by adequate concentrations of drugs. And so again, keep that in mind when we come back to interpreting some of the trial results we're going to talk about. So let's just jump to the chase. Given the limitations of time and the fact I'd like to have time for questions, I don't want to go through all of these trials in detail, but I will point out what I think are the unique contributions and the disparities that we need to understand. So let's just look first at the bottom three trials. Those are three of the most recent trials of oral uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I think you heard about the IPREX study briefly this morning. That was a study of men having sex with men um, in many countries. And overall, the reduction there was 44% got daily oral Truvada. One thing I'll point out is that here, adherence in the IPREC study overall was not super fantastic. In fact, less than 50% of men in the active arms had Truvada detected. So it's not just the later trials in heterosexuals that showed some issues with adherence. There were clear issues in IPREX as well. However, as we'll see, they achieved statistical significance in terms of efficacy, and in fact, with higher efficacy, both as estimated by self-report, pill counts, and drug levels, showed a significant protection with high levels of taking the product. The TDF2 study was a study of heterosexuals in Botswana, and that showed a 62% uh, efficacy with daily oral Truvada. And then the Partners PrEP study, which I'll talk about because I think it's unique, was a study of discordant couples um, in which one person had HIV and the other did not. The person without HIV was randomized to receive either oral Truvada oral tenofovir or oral placebo, and that study showed a remarkable reduction in the risk of acquisition, 67% for daily oral Truvada, 75% for daily oral, uh, sorry, Truvada, the first was for tenofovir. So pretty astounding reductions along the lines of if we saw that for a vaccine, we would be jumping for joy um, and, and being very excited. So these trials were all reported in a very uh, interesting uh, edition of the New England Journal in July 2012, and you can see them there. 
a uh, very exciting time. However, you'll note that there's one, uh, the Lute Van Damme study, PEP for, H PrEP for HIV infection among women, that did not go along with the other two, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But putting all those data together, considering the adherence data, considering the different trials, the consensus from that body of evidence really was that tenofovir is effective ARV-based PrEP, if you look at everything t taken together and considering adherence. But there were key caveats uh, that I think are very important to consider, and that's really what I want to go into here. So these are the data that were being considered when PrEP was up for approval. Uh, Truvada was up for approval as PrEP in the United States by the FDA. And this just summarizes what, in a different format, what I showed you on the previous table. So Truvada for HIV discordant couples in partners PrEP. 75% with a pretty narrow effect size, above 50%, even at the lower bound of that 95% confidence interval. Very impressive, 55 to 87%. In the TDF2 study, comparable effect size, but very wide interval there. And I just want you to look at that 22% uh, at the lower limit of the confidence interval. And that's probably because the this study had actually very few endpoints. It was actually a large study, but had a very low incidence rates. I think there were only about 63 endpoints. And then you have the IPREX study. And as I pointed out before, although there was a reduction to the tune of 42%, look at the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval there. It's 15%. So what, for those of you who don't do statistics all the time, that's sort of a measure of what the ultimate true estimate of effectiveness could be, um, or efficacy in this case. So it might be 42%, but it definitely is somewhere between 15 and 63%, okay? So when IPREX came out and when IPREX was discussed at the FDA meeting, uh, people acknowledged that there were really wide confidence intervals for the estimate of efficacy outside of the setting of discordant couples. And that was a concern. And then FEMPREP was published, and the results from that came out. If you don't know what FEMPREP is, this was a study led by Lute van Damme, um, primarily in South Africa, although there were also participants from Tanzania um, and Kenya um, and basically, this was a study very similar to IPREX, but done in women. They randomized women to oral Truvada uh, taken daily or oral placebo taken daily. And the ironic thing here is that this group did a very detailed, intense pre-trial behavioral assessment, looking at acceptability of these regimens, looking at risk behaviors, making sure that they could adequately compare changes in risk behaviors in particular before and after PrEP. Because one thing that people, of course, were concerned about was that the magic pill, not Viagra, but Truvada, um, would actually allow people to feel like they didn't need to use condoms, and it would increase their risky behavior. And that's still a big issue that people talk about. So here's what we found for Truvada in women in the FEMPREP study. And the women in FEMPREP were quote unquote high risk women. Um, many of them actually were uh, traded sex for drugs or money, um, mostly money. Um, they actually had to have had more than two partners in the last month. So slightly more high risk than the general population I'm going to talk about in our study in a little bit. But you can see the efficacy was a staggeringly low um, number there. It was actually about 6%. Um, with a very wide confidence interval. So very disappointing. What the heck happened uh, in FEMPREP? Well, it turned out that despite this intensive behavioral approach that they had taken in a very, very rigorous way with excellent behavioral scientists, only 26% of the women randomized to the active arm in FEMPREP actually took the drug, as measured by a highly sensitive assay. One of the, um, we've done obviously a lot of discussions with community um, advocates and educators since these studies have come out, and one of the questions is, well, maybe your drug assay is wrong. Maybe you're really underestimating how well people are taking these products, and I can tell you I wish that was the truth, but I don't believe it is because these drug assays are super sensitive and super specific. In fact, they can actually pick up the drug within an hour after you take it orally, and with newer um, assays within an hour after you use it in a vaginal gel. So I can't blame it on the assay, unfortunately. Despite this, and this is this discordance that I think is a theme as well, 95% of the women reported that they usually always took the pills. And when they looked at the pill counts based on returns, because people were asked to bring back untaken pills, asked to bring back um, empty bottles, the adherence estimates were 86 to 89%. So 
very big discordance here. They had a very young population, and interestingly, when they talked to these women about whether thought they thought they were at risk for HIV, most of them thought that they weren't. 70% um, thought they were at little or no risk at baseline, even though they really didn't use condoms very much, but half of them, and a fair number had STIs, and HIV incidence during the trial was 5%. I don't think anyone would call that low. So these women were at risk. They didn't really see themselves at risk. They said they were using the products. They weren't using the products, and the study did not show efficacy. And that's a story we're going to hear again. So this just leads up to the FDA Antiviral Drugs Advisory Committee meeting, which took place, and this is the US FDA, which I think is quite relevant for you to know about. That took place just about a year ago. This was a marathon meeting, 13 hours. Um, it, was, it was a fascinating meeting, actually. And what did they end up doing with the data that I just showed you? So the IPREX data, the TDF2 data, the partners data, and the FEMPREP data. The two trials that really were pivotal for the approval of Truvada for PrEP were IPREX and and partners prep. So ultimately, the panel recommended approval, and the FDA went with this, as you know, um, of daily Truvada for HIV prevention in three groups. And I think the votes are really illustrative. For men who have sex with men, 19 in favor and three against. So people were pretty convinced. The three people who weren't convinced largely said, well, you've got that 15% lower 95% confidence interval. Do we really know that this is effective? And moreover, is this going to make gay men feel like they can have more unprotected sex? That was a very big theme. Um, what about for discordant couples? There was less dissension there. 19 were in favor and two were against it. Um, and the two who were against it really were against it because they felt like the data in women were not solid enough, as we're going to see in a moment. And they, I think, took into account the FEMPREP data as well as the fact that in the Partners in Prevention study, there were more men than women, although, as I'll show you in a little bit, the efficacy was very similar for men and women. And then this third group is really the, I think, obviously the tricky one. Other populations. So this primarily included heterosexual men, women, regardless of who they were having sex with, but mostly heterosexual women for the purposes of this discussion, and injection drug users. And you can see that the vote was actually quite split, although it went in favor 12 to 8. There was a lot of dissension, and I'm just going to point out some of the issues because I think that the discussion really informs where we as providers at are at in PrEP and what patients see PrEP as. Uh, Dr. Corey mentioned that the uptake of PrEP in some of the studies in the US is low, and I can tell you in my own population, both in the STD clinic um, and in uh, my, my HIV patients' partners, I believe that's true as well, and I think it's important to dissect that when we have a potentially effective biological intervention. So there was a vigorous discussion at this meeting, vigorous to the as I mentioned, the length of 13 hours. Um, what were the concerns? Antiretroviral resistance if PrEP was used during primary infection. That was a big one in IPREX. There were three infections that occurred when Truvada was given during what turned out to be primary infection during the first four weeks of study enrollment. One of those ended up having a resistant virus. Um, and those people actually were all symptomatic. So it really, I think one big lesson is if you're going to use PrEP, you absolutely have to make sure clearly that there is no uh, primary antibody negative infection. And we can talk about that if you have time. Behavioral risk I mentioned, a lot of discussion about whether providers were going to be adequately trained to understand the nuances of PrEP, because who was going to be doing PrEP? It wasn't going to be HIV care providers, because most of us who do solely HIV care take care of HIV-infected patients. It's probably going to be people who are seeing the many gay men, for example, who have syphilis and gonorrhea uh, in our STD care settings who remain, luckily, HIV uninfected ideal candidates for PrEP? How are we going to pr really train those providers to do this? And then a lot of people said, well, if you have to take this daily, that's crazy. How are you going to get healthy, uninfected people really to take this product daily? They're going to want to take it on the weekends when they go to their white parties. They're going to want to take it, you know, as party PrEP, which I think makes perfect sense. So if you have a chance and you are interested in this, I would really strongly urge you to take a read of these two perspectives that were published in Annals of Internal Medicine right after the uh, FDA meeting. And one was by Judith Feinberg, who's been in the HIV clinical trials arena for many decades, very experienced. And one was by Lauren Wood, who's a women's uh, health care provider who's at CDC. 
And they actually, I think, bravely um, uh, articulated why they voted for and against uh, Truvada as PrEP. And Dr. Feinberg, I think, um, noted that the rationale, the biological rationale derived from treatment as prevention, PMTCT made sense. Um, she noted that there were some renal and bone toxicities in iPrep, but they were really pretty minimal. And she noted a couple of other things. Why uh, Dr. Wood voted no, I think is probably best um, described in her quotes. So I'll show you my favorite quotes from each of these. So what Dr. Feinberg said was the backdrop to my decision was the incontrovertible fact that over the 30 years of the pandemic, 60 million persons have been infected, 30 million have died, hundreds of million are at high risk. There is no effective vaccine available or on the horizon. I hope that's not true yet. But after careful study and deliberation, I concluded that it's a strategy that when appropriately used and monitored can help turn the tide, I voted yes. And I think that's really what people felt. What about the contrary view, which I think is very valid and important to understand? An effective tool used incorrectly or inconsistently is reduced to an ineffective tool. The data presented objectively document that most persons enrolled in the two pivotal efficacy trials on which the approval indication is based did not use the tool consistently or correctly thereby substantially limiting its potential efficacy and overall utility in preventing HIV. So very interesting views. You've got one person who says it's biologically effective. Um, we're in a really bad place with HIV. We still can't prevent it. I think it should be available. And this other person who says, well, people aren't going to use it anyway. Why should we make a product available that apparently is not acceptable to the most vulnerable at risk? I think a very interesting argument. So it got approved, and then we released the results at CORI this year of our study, which was the voice study, or is the voice study, MTN003. And I'll just show you what our conclusions were. And in fact, it's going to turn out to be quite sadly similar to FEMPREP. This was a study that randomized 5,029 women uh, from South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe to one of five arms. Daily oral Truvada, daily oral tenofovir, daily oral placebo, daily vaginal 1% tenofovir gel, the same product that was used in the Caprisa 004 trial, which I'll talk about in a moment, or vaginal placebo gel. Um, we followed women for, on average, about two years, um, 18 months to two years, um, and we uh, completed follow-up of all these women in um, August of last year. Okay, now, and these are the primary efficacy results. If you are a clinical trialist, um, you will recognize that this is probably the most depressing slide of life. Um, if you're not, I'll tell you why it's an incredibly depressing slide. Basically, what you want to see in a clinical trial in a Kaplan-Meier survival analysis curve is the lines separating. So um, you can see here that over the course of our follow-up, by all treatment arms, you may try to convince yourself that there are some differences here, but there are not significant differences here. Moreover, the differences are not in the direction that you would like to see. You'll note that the placebo um, arm, actually the gel placebo arm, is at the highest um, level there. So very disappointing um, results. Um, what did we see in terms of uh, adherence? Well, I can tell you that by self-report, both face-to-face -face interviews, pharmacist interviews, return of product, both unused gel applicators, unused tablets, empty pill bottles, by a CASI, which is the audio computer assisted self-interview, which we thought would get more honest disclosures about adherence, which has been shown in the past. We had no cause whatsoever to be concerned about adherence over the course of the study. We knew that some women were challenged, um, and we knew that also some women were um, had difficulty disclosing non-use because of the hierarchical settings of you know, medical care in these clinics. It is hard, just like it's hard when you go to your doctor and you don't say, well, actually, I do drink two glasses of wine a night. Um, you don't say that often. Um, so it, it is hard for people to, um, I think, to always disclose what they think might be unacceptable behavior to providers. And I think that's true for everybody. Imagine this, where you've got women who are very vulnerable, um, really often can't make decisions about their own health care or even their lives, um, and having a very hard time telling people that they weren't doing what they were quote unquote supposed to do. We've done a lot of qualitative research since this uh, has happened, and we're still doing that. And I'm happy to discuss that further if we have time. But I know, having followed people very closely through the study, that women had a lot of challenges being in the study. There were a lot of partner issues. Partners thought that, male partners often thought that women were participating because they were 
they had HIV infection or they were at risk for HIV infection. They got messages from sisters and mothers sometimes that it was really kind of not a very good idea to do this. So it was it was a really a major issue for a lot of women. That said, we ended up with retaining 95% of the expected person years. So retention was excellent. So by all those measures that I mentioned, women said they were taking the product between 86 to 90% of the time. 95. What did we find out when we looked at the tenofovir levels in blood? It was really abysmal, and it was very similar to um, to the uh, FEMPREP study. And this just shows you the percent of women with detectable tenofovir over time. And you can see even at the first quarterly visit by all of the active product arms, we detected the drug in less than 40% of women, and it just got worse from there. So very disappointing, but clearly answered one of the study questions. These products were not acceptable to women. Uh, really, that is not what they wanted to do. We looked at predictors of who used the drug, and we found that women who were older than 25, women who were in stable relationships, and women who had a partner who was older were more likely to use the product significantly. And who are those women? Those are the women who are exactly in the Partners in Prevention study, and I'm going to show you that right now. What data speak to the situation when people do take their drugs? So the Partners PrEP study, which I mentioned before, um, was a heroic study, and Dr. Corey was involved, um, of almost 5,000 HIV serodiscordant couple, an amazing logistical effort to enroll people. Um, the negative partner, as I mentioned, was randomized to one of three groups, which I had talked to you about before, and basically was followed for HIV infection. And this is what they showed in a little bit more detail, just so you're clear. Um, you can see that the protection for tenofovir, 62%, versus Truvada, 73%, and really remarkable reduction in the numbers, 47 infections in the placebo arm, 18 and 13 respectively. So really exciting results. So very different from our study, but I think that our study pretty much confirms that women need to have some infrastructure, some support, and not just women, it's men as well, whether they're in a relationship or whether it's a community support to enable them to take these products. So what about the gel? What's going on with that? Well, there was a lot of excitement when the Caprisa 004 study was released, um, was published in Science in 2010. And this was a study of about 900 women. It was led by Slim and Kareisha Abdul Karim. It was done in Durban, South Africa, which has some of the highest incidence rates. And I should mention that our incidence rates, I didn't tell you this, but in South Africa, some of the South African sites in voice were 10% to 10.5%. So we'll come back to talk about that if we've got time later. And um, that's relevant because of what I'm going to show you in this next slide. Caprisa was different than Voice. So remember in Voice we asked women to use the product daily. Caprisa asked women to use the product before and after sex for and after vaginal intercourse. These were young uh, women, age 23, very similar to the South African women in our study, in the voice study. Most of them were unmarried. And they had a couple of settings, both rural and urban. And it's the very same product that we use. Now this, in contrast, is the kind of Kaplan-Meier curve we would have liked to have seen in invoice. You can see there's a clear um, separation as you go out over time between the placebo and the tenofovir. And in fact, the incidence in the tenofovir versus placebo arms was 5.6 versus 9.1 percent. And that was significant, gave us an HIV effectiveness of 39 percent. The other big surprise in this study, which I didn't put a slide in for, but which no one anticipated, was that the incidence of new HSV2 infections in the tenofovir gel arm was actually reduced by an even more um, uh, higher, higher amount. It's actually reduced by almost 50%. So tenofovir gel prevented the acquisition of HSV2. Um, we're going to be looking that in, at that in the voice study, and I think given some of the zero incidence rates that we are seeing for HSV2, which I hope to be presenting this July uh, at a meeting in uh, at the ISSTDR meeting, I'm hoping we will be able to at least get a good answer about that, um, and maybe it will be a little bit more positive than what we were able to show for HIV. Um, so really, I think an amazingly exciting study. However. Even with the gel, they were able to show this relationship between effectiveness or, or efficacy and adherence. And they did this by a couple of measures, not just self-report, but Caprisa had women bring back applicators that were used and unused. And they trained people to actually discern whether the applicators had been inserted vaginally. We didn't do that in voice because it was a study that was over almost six times the size of this, and we had a lot of pushback from our community working groups and our staff saying, 
it's really unfair to ask women to have to hang on to these applicators. Some of them don't even have room for the drug that you're asking them to take, and there's nowhere we can keep these things. It's really logistically too big of a challenge, mostly for the participants. So while we did have people bring back the unused, we didn't have them bring back the used. But you can see that the effectiveness or the efficacy, sorry, um, spectrum goes just the same way as it did in IPREX um, and also in Partners Prep, which I didn't mention. So just the last couple of slides before I take questions, it's really how do we put this all together and what are the implications as we talk to patients um, about or, you know, either HIV infected patients for their partners um, or people who are trying not to get HIV? How can we explain the divergent results in women? You've got vaginal tenofovir gel with a very nice signal in Caprisa 004 and a clear flat signal in voice. No signal, I guess is a better way to say it. Um, and then for oral tenofovir products, you've got voice and femprep, low adherence, no efficacy, and then partners in prevention and TDF2. And I guess I would just say that I don't think it's just adherence. I think adherence is probably a major driver, but I think we have to look at it in a more sophisticated matrix. And I've tried to sort of outline that this this concept on this slide, and this is a slide that I've adapted from Jared Baton, who led the Partners in Prevention study, and it just points out that, you know, we like simple explanations, I think, um, but people's lives aren't simple. The genital tract's not simple. Certainly the mucosal immunology, the microbiome is not simple. And uh, pharmacokinetics are not simple. It turns out that when you take oral Truvada products, oral Truvada, oral tenofovir, you probably get concentrations in the rectum that are considerably higher than that in the cervicovaginal tissue. And that means that this interaction between adherence, pharmacokinetics, and what's happening where the rubber hits the road, i.e. the rectal or the cervicovaginal mucosa, is really complicated. It may be that PrEP involved in rectal exposure with unprotected anal sex is somewhat more forgiving of maybe missed doses. Maybe it's a little more forgiving of incident STIs like proctitis. Um, we don't really know, and I think that's a really important question that people are interested in looking at. There may be interactions between topical tenofovir and microbiome. It's possible that the disruption of the vaginal microbiome may actually affect the likelihood of phosphorylation of uh, tenofovir as it goes towards the TDF, uh, intracellular uh, phosphorylated component. We don't know. These are all things that are under active investigation. So what I've tried to outline here really is obviously adherence is gigantic. If you don't take the drug, all bets are off and nothing's going to work, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think that does need to be very high on the level. But then there is behavior, too. There's frequency for women of anal versus vaginal intercourse. And I think, obviously, we know that anal intercourse is practiced not infrequently uh, by, by heterosexual women. And so you've got to think about the relative protection in those compartments if your partner is HIV positive. Vaginal hygiene practices, very important. If women are douching or using other products, um, that could also be an issue. And then the biology, I think, is really critical. Our genital drug levels in the activated form different in different compartments, and how is that going to play out? Do inflammatory processes, such as sexually transmitted infections, including herpes, incident herpes in the um, Caprisa 004 study, HSV2 infection was 20%. So you've got to believe that incidence of HSV2, which we know profoundly impacts the likelihood of HIV is very different for an 18-year-old woman in Durban who may be having new partners, partners with a very high HIV viral load, et cetera. The likelihood of her getting HSV2 is much greater than somebody who's been in a stable relationship in a discordant couple who may be 40 and trying to prevent HIV. So really, really, I think may be important distinctions. Um, I think the viral load in the partner we know is the major determinant of transmission. There's no question. When you're in Durban and you're looking at a place where we saw incidence rates of 10%, you've got to believe that the community viral load is off the map, and off the chart. And so, you know, the likelihood of that overriding what might be marginally effective PrEP at the tissue, I think is, is very important. And then I do think the microbiome, especially in the vagina, people are starting to look at the rectum. Uh, but per certainly, given what we know about protective lactobacilli, 
vaginal defenses, particularly around pregnancy, um, I think that's going to be critical. So my, my main message here is that while I think adherence is probably the primary message, there are, when you think about implementing PrEP widely, much more subtle, uh, probably much more complex interactions we're going to think about, and especially when you start thinking about PrEP interactions with vaccine settings. The oral Truvada products obviously uh, Genofir products are not approved in South Africa, as Dr. Corey mentioned, but South Africa Physicians, HIV Physicians uh, Association does have guidelines for the use of PrEP in MSM that are very similar to the CDC's uh, recommendations in the United States, the U.S. CDC's recommendations. So I do think this is an issue that's going to come up and, as Dr. Corey mentioned, really requires vigorous, careful, thoughtful discussions, not only with local investigators, but also with community um, representatives and participants, because I think it's really critical. And I think probably what's going to happen as this is further explored is that ultimately PrEP will become part of the standard prevention package that you offer and people will or will not take it. And as was noted, the uptake may be particularly low. So where do we go from here? I think where we're at with PrEP, and certainly here in Canada, where I don't think that um, you have as quite as clear um, guidelines or a sense of maybe maybe a sense of what's going on, although I've talked to some of you and who, who've been uh, providing really interesting information. Really, we're at the point of demonstration projects. I think trying to figure out if these drugs are going to be taken, are people going to pay for them? In the U.S., obviously, you've got to pay for them. You can get insurance to cover them in some cases, and I know people have become very creative about how they actually prescribe PrEP so that insurance can um, cover them, and that's an interesting area. But really, how do you prioritize it and how to deliver it in the U.S.? Largely, we're looking at settings where men with sex with men have high incident STD rates. To do that, we really have to know where that's occurring, and that's not occurring in HIV clinics where they're HIV uninfected. So it takes us out of the realm of the comfortable HIV care setting into public health clinics, into community clinics that are seeing a lot of infection, and into providers, to private providers' offices. So really challenging issues. Uptake, do people who might, who are, who, do people who need to benefit it most want it? I think that's a $100 million question, and I don't think we've really answered it yet. And I think that we need to take a deep breath with prevention and interventions in general. We always think we know what's best. We thought these drugs would work. We thought people would take a drug every day. We had good evidence to say that they would, and it didn't happen. So I think taking a step back is really important. That adherence issue is a big deal. Sexual behavior, people still need to be reassured that PrEP is not going to induce a wild, crazy sexual revolution um, and even further increase the out-of-control syphilis and gonorrhea incidents we're seeing in men who have sex with men. Um, do I know that's going to happen? Can I be positive? I can't. Uh, I don't know. So it's an important question. And then ultimately the real question, is this going to impact HIV incidence? Is it really going to help? Uh, not at the individual level, but at the community viral load and the population level. And I think we do not know. I will say that this adherence issue has been um, so important and so much on people's minds that they've actually started designing products to get around the issue of taking a pill every day. And I'll show you one example, which is the Aspire study. This is MTN020. And this is a trial of a vaginal ring, very similar to the NuvaRing contraceptive ring uh, that's very popular for contraception, except that it's got dipivirine in it, which is an NNRTI, uh, as some of you may know. And women insert this vaginally and leave it in basically for a month, come back to the clinic and get it replaced. Um, and that's actually underway. They've enrolled, I think, close to 1,500 women now, so they're, they're very far along. And we anticipate results to be available late 2014 or 2015. The question remains, are these women going to use the ring? Um, or do they see themselves enough at risk to really keep the ring in for a month? And these are sites that are in Africa, very similar to the sites that were used in voice and femprep. So it will be a very interesting question. Are there other drugs that we should think about for PrEP? Well, I've just listed a few of them here. Um, the dipivirine vaginal ring I mentioned, there are other rings, there are oral uh, protocols particularly aimed at men who have sex with men, oral Maraviroc plus Truvada, those are mostly safety studies though, they really haven't progressed to efficacy. Um, there are, very interestingly, some products, real pivirine TMC-278 is a long-acting injectable which will have sustained levels of real pivirine given once monthly, and there is a phase one safety study that's underway in the UK. Um, so that's another interesting sort of depot prep idea. So you could imagine that women would come in for their depot 
uh, progesterone for contraception, and then they would get their depot prep um, in perhaps some version of a perfect world. I don't know how perfect that is, but it's something. And then there were some really interesting um, presentations at Croy this year um, in macaques, again, looking at tenofovir intravaginal rings and also sustained release parenteral integrase inhibitors as prep. And again, in the animal models, these things look super fantastic. But I qualify that by saying that the animal models for the products that we used in the clinical trials also looked super fantastic. So we really have to carefully dissect, I think, what looks great at the biomedical and um, bench to bedside kind of uh, approach versus the community implementation. So the last slide is just to note treatment and its prevention. This coming to Vancouver to talk about this is like, you know, coming to Seattle to talk about herpes. Um, so I won't, I mean, this is why I only have one slide here. Um, I think that the only thing I will say is that treatment as prevention for women in particular, um, I think that there, there may be some interesting um, areas that could um, differentiate the efficacy uh, for men and women, and I've just noted them there. Uh, remember that the female genital tract is a dynamic thing. Um, <laughs> I know it's hard to believe. Um, it's, it's a dynamic situation. Um, it, and it's, it's got a lot going on independent of the viral load of infecting partners. So I'll just leave you with that idea. Um, and then there also are some interesting data coming out that women may progress through the treatment cascade differently than men. And remember, the treatment cascade is kind of where it's at, right, as you're thinking about how you uh, have a metric of getting into care and getting suppressed. And the barriers, basically, to getting to the ideal side of the cascade, they're different for everybody. But in general, given some of the issues I mentioned for women in particular, and really any marginalized or vulnerable population, is just more challenging. And that can be true for young MSM as well. And so I would definitely note that. So I guess overall, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic about biomedical prevention. I think that circuitly circumcision is a great option for heterosexual men. I didn't show you the data. There's a nice modeling uh, paper um, by Jorge Sanchez and, and his group with uh, Connie Kellum. Um, and they actually looked at um, the effect of circumcision in MSM. And they showed, at least by modeling, that the more um, unprotected, insertive, uh, uh, acts people showed, the higher the estimated efficacy was for circumcision. That would make total sense. So I think it's not a no, it's not dead, but it's certainly not going to be a public health priority. Uh, again, I think oral prep works with caveats. You got to take it. Um, you got to believe you're at risk. You got to believe that enough to be really adherent. Remember that a biomedical intervention is almost always a behavioral intervention, and that has major impl implications for how we implement this intervention. And there's some support for topical prevention only in the Caprisa 004 study. I should mention that there are some other studies you should know about. The FACTS 001 study is a study in South Africa that is replicating Caprisa 004. Um, they are pretty much almost enrolled, I think about three quarters of the way, um, and that'll be a very interesting study. We anticipate the results to be out in the next year and a half or so. There are also studies looking at safety of rectal tenofovir gel. This is a reformulated gel uh, from what we used in Voice and Caprisa because interestingly enough that gel was hyperosmolar and created too many GI uh, side effects including diarrhea and abdominal pain and that's actually going to target obviously this gel as a lubricant for men who have sex with men um, with uh, anal intercourse, and that's kind of interesting. I don't know, I think there are some interesting um, possibilities that it might work. Again, you know, who knows, could you combine the tenofovir gel as a lubricant with oral prep to really bump up the IPREX efficacies? You got to use a lube anyway, or you should use a lube anyway. Why not use a lube that has tenofovir in it, or some antiretroviral? So that's kind of the thinking. And then I mentioned the dipivirine ring. So with that, I'll finish up and thank you very much for your attention and just want to acknowledge Connie and Jared who provided a variance of several of these slides. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeannie, for an excellent uh, opening plenary. I think we're, we have time to just maybe squeeze in one really, really quick question if there's a pressing question anywhere in the audience. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the uh, microphones will come to you. Um, hi, thank you for your talk and, and very helpful review of, of, you know, several trials and the results. And I'm, I'm just wondering, as you know, certainly you're saying, if most of the variance in the efficacy of the products in these trials is due to behavioral and social factors, 
aren't there much less expensive ways to find out before starting a trial mm -hmm. whether they may be acceptable or not? And would you suggest, you know, more preclinical acceptability research and the like? Uh, you know, and I, I certainly don't have the answers, but I'm just, you know, wondering. It's certainly a very expensive way to find out that a product is not acceptable. <laughs> I fully agree with you. Um, I could not agree more that we need a better way to determine product uptake and use. However, having reviewed an unbelievable number of manuscripts that purported to show the acceptability, theoretical acceptability of microbicides, I will never look at another one again. Because everybody says they would use it. Yes, they would love it. Uh, even if it's only 30% effective, even if it's only 50% effective, yes, I will use it every time. And you know, the reality is that it's not used. So. I think we need to rethink even how we get those estimates. I don't know, I agree that it, you can do it with less expense, but we need to do it with more thought and more honesty. And that's the really hard, really hard thing. So I appreciate the comment because I think it's, it's really where we're at right now. Thank you. Donc, uh, veuillez uh, me rejoindre encore une fois à remercier uh, Dr. Maratza pour une excellente présentation.